Hey guys, this is Cece and I'm with the WGSN DB Going Solo Network. We're going to be showcasing something a little bit unique today. We're going to be showcasing the author's corner, meet the author. We have a fabulous author here with us today, but we're also going to showcase our brand new show, which is going to be starting here soon. And that is the Veterans Corner. It's a Going Solo Veterans Corner. We have our wonderful host here that's going to join me today with interviewing our terrific author here today. So those of you that don't know me. I'm Cece Schatz. I'm the doyen of relationship building. And what I do is really connect you with some awesome people, helping move you through to really living your best life. And our authors are truly the best around. And we have an elite uh, guest with us here today, which I'm very, very excited. All of his information is right there on goingsolomedia.com. And just a little homework before we start. Of course, you guys know you can comment. Um, share, like, all of that stuff, just so that we make sure all of our information gets out and that we know we're really giving you the information that you'd like to listen to. So please do that for us. We would appreciate it. So let's not waste any more time. We've got the guys here in the gallery waiting for us. I'm going to bring them up here. So we've got our wonderful guest here today. Let's see if we can... Uh, Bring him up. There we go. We got that. We got all the guys up here. So let's interview, introduce all of the guys to you here so you guys know what's going on. We have our wonderful guest. I'd like to introduce him. He is. Um, he wrote this terrific book, and Steve Snyder is wonderful. He wrote this awesome book regarding his dad, who is a, it's a true story. It's called Shot Down. He was a pilot. His dad's name is Howard Snyder. And the crew of B-17, Susan Ruth from, uh, and he's from Seal Beach, California. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Cece. Uh, it's great having you. Now, you're also the past president of the 306 Bomb it's a bomb group uh, historical association. That's correct. Wow, that's very, very impressive. So I want to thank you so much for your service and all of that. We we just so appreciate it. We truly do. So not only you and your father. So we're going to get to know a little, the book here in just a few minutes and kind of your journey on writing it. And I'm excited to find out a little bit more about that. But let me introduce you to our brand new host here. That's um, Paul Her Holbert. And uh, his information, I just want to show you guys here what it is. He's going to be our host of our new show show, which is called Going Solo Veterans. He is an author of his new and the latest book is Term Limits. And of course, you guys can uh, find him right there on his website, which we posted. And he's a little literary vet. And um, so and that's spelled if you guys want to write it down, it's spelled L-I-T-E-R-A-R-Y-V-E-T. -E -E and of course, that's his website too, dot net. And so uh, we want to make sure you guys have that. So welcome to the show, Paul. This is your first time joining us. So welcome. Yeah, thank you, Cece. I'm really looking forward to this opportunity to see in how, how you operate here and to see what Steve can share with us as well, uh, especially being a veteran myself. I really am interested to see, see what his story is like. It's wonderful having you. Now, don't take any, um, you know, you don't have to do anything that I do. So <laughs> all the bad things I do, don't pick them up. So anyhow, <laughs> but Steve, let's get on to your book because I'm very, very excited about sharing um, with our audience, not only the book, but your journey of writing it. So tell us why, of course, you know, your dad was a pretty awesome person, you know, and the, what he's experienced and all of the, you know, all the crew there on the B-17. So tell us about the journey of you really trying, you know, de determining this is what you want to do. You want to bring this, uh, this story alive. So share with us your journey. Sure. Um, well, growing up, I knew the basics of my dad's World War II history. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. Uh, he was stationed in England with the 8th Air Force. His plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. Uh, he flew bombing missions over Europe. And uh, on February 8th of 1944, his plane was shot down over Belgium. And after he bailed out, he was missing in action for seven months, but he evaded capture and eventually made it back to England. But it wasn't until I retired uh, from my career uh, job in 2009 that I really had the time to delve into my dad's war history in more detail. And at that time, I had no intention of writing a book whatsoever. 
Uh, my parents had kept a lot of material from the war years, and I just wanted to go through all that and kind of organize it and learn more. And there were two items that were really significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action about his plane being shot down that's absolutely riveting, which is in the book. And the other uh, item were all the letters that my dad had written to my mother while he was stationed in England. And my dad was very candid in uh, the letters that he wrote to my mother. He, he talks about what bombing missions were like, uh, what life was like on the airfield in England, what life was like in London and England at the time, uh, escapades of him and his crew. And I just became fascinated uh, with the story of uh, my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. And so I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe. I went on the internet and spent countless hours doing research, downloading declassified military documents. I went on a quest to find relatives of all of my dad's crew members, uh, B-17 had a 10 man crew. And I was successful in doing that. And I asked them for any information they could give me, newspaper articles, uh, pictures, uh, letters, uh, I joined a number of World War II organizations, uh, started going to reunions, listening to veterans tell their stories. And finally, three years into this, I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that people needed to, to know about it and read about it. So I decided to write a book. Uh, the book was published in uh, 2014. And... Uh, it's uh, changed my life, basically, <laughs> uh, after writing that book. But very inspirational because, you know, learning about our past, you know, learning about something that happened, we have no idea. You know, I would have no idea of what, what happened in your dad's era and, and what he went through. And being able to, you know, experience that and sharing that with everyone it's pretty awesome so how long did was that process again that you that took you for to write the book itself it was, uh, it was uh from the time i started my research to the time the book was published was four and a half years and i actually uh published the book independently by forming my uh a one person limited liability company i formed my own publishing company <laughs> uh, called Sea Breeze Publishing, which is the name of the street that I live on in, in Seal Beach. And then I contracted with independent professionals for all the associated services, such as editing, cover design, interior layout, uh, printing the book, and, and fulfillment. And uh, it really took me on uh, quite a journey since I had, uh, after I finished the manuscript, I had no idea and then how to get the book printed. And I looked into various forms of how to do of uh, how to do that, and I decided uh, just forming my own publishing company was the best for me, which is the most complicated way to do it, and probably more expensive. But I felt that just fit fit my needs uh, uh, better. And as I mentioned, it, it's changed my life. I went from just a you know a retiree taking long walks and naps and reading books. Uh, so now it's basically a full-time job. I spend, uh, I travel all over the United States. Well, not right now. Uh, uh, attending air shows, signing copies of the book. I do a lot of uh, speaking to all sorts of different organizations. I, I on social media for hours every day, uh, promoting the book. And as I said, it's changed my life and been uh, the really rewarding experience. I can imagine. I totally can imagine. You know, it is it not only is it just a wonderful tribute to your father and those that, you know, were were in the service with him, you know, right there on, on the on so I you know, I am curious about something. I wanted to ask you though, just it, it just popped into my mind. Is how was he able to name the plane? You know, he was able to create the name of the plane. So I just I always thought the names of planes were just something that they were given, but they, but he was able to actually name the plane himself, huh? Yes. Well, he was the, uh, the first pilot, uh, of the crew. And as such, he was the commander of both the plane and the crew. So the, the pilot, uh, was, had the last say on what a plane would be named, uh, of the oh. 10 men, uh, man crew, uh, three of the 10 were married, uh, but my dad was the only uh, crew member that had a child. 
And so I guess just that by process elimination, it just came to be that uh, he wanted to name his plane uh, after his one-year-old daughter and the rest of the crew were uh, happy, happy to do that. So uh, that, that's how that, it's interesting uh, also about naming the planes and also uh, what was painted on the planes called nose art. Uh, the Air Force was the only entity that allowed their planes to be painted. The Marines didn't, uh, the Navy didn't, nor did other countries. But the Air Force thought it would help the morale of these young guys, of these crew, combat crews, if they could personalize their planes and uh, name them and paint them. And they were very creative what, in what they uh, named and painted on their, their planes. Uh, many times it was a cartoon character, but more often than not, it was a scantily clad or, or nude woman. Uh, because they, had, they have to remember that these air crews were made up of guys, uh, these young guys in their late teens and early 20s. Mm -hmm. so they were virile young men, and uh, they missed the uh, female companionship of, of those back home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, they put on their planes. That's very interesting. Paul, do you have any uh, questions or any comments? Well, I was just going to say it was to kind of add on to what Steve said about uh, the young men flying the planes and, and the uh, various pictures they used to put on the front. And it's probably the reason why Paul Tibbetts, who flew the plane that dropped the atomic bomb into Japan, named it after his mother, but didn't have a picture on it, only her name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, uh, it, it's interesting, uh, Paul, that... Uh, my dad's flight engineer was named Roy Holbert. So uh, ah. one of the crew members had this has has your last name. I don't know if you go if you go back. There's any uh, relationship there, but uh, he was yeah, one. I, of ten I'd crew. have to check that out. That that would be interesting. I, I might take a look at that. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that something? It is amazing because you know there's so many people you know that are associated with the service. And so it, there's just a tremendous amount. So as we're growing up, and that's why I kind of named our our um, show today, Our History Shapes Us and the US, USA, because it most certainly does, you know, because, I, you know, as we evolve in throughout our, you know, the time of service, so many people are um, are in service, you know, when, when it was a time of need there. And so, you know, that's our, our history. Our families were all there. You know, I have my dad, of course, and then my, my uncle and and my uncle's uncles. And I mean, there's, it's been it's you know, they've all had a, a run in the in the service and my son, of course. So. Uh, so, yeah. So it's um, it's amazing how, you know, our service uh, individuals today, how they really shape our um how our world that uh, are you know in the usa here so it's a it's amazing and then of course our time of crisis now with the coronavirus you know all of that the uh, service is doing to uh to help us so yeah so we want to really commend them for that so all right so so you know this this is really in a unique oh we do have a comment here let's see oh here's that Sally wrote. Thank you, Sally, for commenting. We appreciate that. Thank you for your service. So that's wonderful. So we do have listeners that are listening to this on the show. So we do appreciate that. So, um, so this, these stories that you you put together, you put together with regards to um, your, you know, your father's experiences and the letters and all of that. So, um, were you able to go back into um, the you know, helping, um, you know, going back into the families of the men that were on, on the uh, plane also on the, you know, in his crew. Yes. Um, also the, the, the book's just not about my dad, but it's about what happened to each member of the crew because something different happened to each man of the 10 man crew. Five of them made it back home, but five of them did not. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also about all the Belgian people that risked their lives trying to, to help them. Uh, the first half of the book kind of builds up to the day that the plane was shot down. And then the second half of the book is all about what happened uh, afterwards. Um, and it's all based on firsthand t testimony by the people who were involved uh, in, 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 in the story either members of the crew that survived, uh, members of the Belgium underground, 
I even uh, located a German Luftwaffe pilot that shot down my dad's plane and interviewed him for the book. Mm, wow. uh, but I probably wouldn't have written the book if it wasn't for two Belgium gentlemen. Uh, their names are Dr. Paul Delahaye and Jacques Lalot. And they were young boys during the war and greatly affected by it. They saw firsthand the atrocities committed against family and friends by the Nazis. And later in life, they became local historians and they interviewed all these Belgian people and members of the Belgium underground about events that took place involving my dad and his crew. And they documented their testimony. And they gave me unbelievably detailed information about events that have been, would have been lost forever without their research. So I owe them a, a huge debt. Uh, Dr. Delahaye passed away in 2013 at 80, 82 years old. Jacques is still with us and a dear friend of mine. So I really owe them a, a huge debt. Uh, so really, it, the, the story itself, and the book's kind of two types of books uh, into one. One's the story of what took place, and then the other is what I added, was, and that's a great deal of uh, historical information and anecdotes about and surrounding the war to put it, put it into context. That's amazing. And so, so when you're doing your research for that, what did you, did you, is there a particular, um, you know, how did you get your information? Did you get through like libraries or you, of course, you probably went back through some of the uh, documentation, of course, that you had with the names and all of that. So how were you able to reach out? Did you use social media? How did you able to reach out to some of those uh, individuals to be able to get different stories? Get well, their lives. Uh, of, of course, without the internet, I would have been uh, you know, <laughs> very handicapped uh, in contacting all these relatives to, to get information for me or to find that German Luftwaffe pilot whose name is Hans Berger. And uh, actually, Hans is the only person from the story that's still with us today. Uh, he lives in Munich, Germany. He's 96 years old. We've become uh, very good, good friends. But my dad had left uh, quite a bit of information. And um, my first trip to Belgium, I've been to Belgium six times, was with my parents. And a lot of the houses that my dad was hidden in and farms are still there today. And so uh, my first trip was in 1994, the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium and of my dad's plane being shot down. And going over there, uh, accompanying my parents, and seen all these places firsthand uh, really made it personal for me. So uh, from what my dad told me, what other members of the crew uh, either communicated in interviews or, you know, uh, or wrote down in, in written accounts or kind of little uh, diaries or histories, and then all that information about uh, uh, from the Belgian people that were involved in, in the story, uh, declassified military documents, war crimes reports. I, I am so fortunate and blessed that I had so much information at my disposal. You know, most people know very little about their World War II veteran, whether it's a grandfather or father. Um, but uh, I know an amazing amount uh, of information and detail extreme detail about what, what happened, not only to my dad, but uh, other members of the crew so that I was able to, you know, put it all in, into a book. Uh, my biggest challenge in writing the book was just how to organize all that. So the story flowed and was readable, you know, to people who would uh, read the story. Um, so it's just, it was, it's just, an, it was an amazing experience. And, uh, that's another reason why I wrote the book is because I had so much information to add to the book. Uh, there's a lots of, uh, I have lots of letters, not only from my dad that he had written to my mother, but members of the crew or members of the family of the crew and excerpts from those letters are in the book that make it very personal. And also in the print book, there's over 200 time period photographs. So you can visualize everything that uh, you're reading about many of those uh, photographs were either sent to my dad from helpers, people that hit him during the war, or that were provided to me by Jacques Olo or Dr. Delahaye. That's just marvelous. It truly is. Don't you think, Paul? I mean, it's just outstanding because it's, you know, it, and we don't realize how important, you know, keeping our pictures and keeping, you know, things and keeping it organized and keeping the letters and all of those things, what a difference it can make for the people that, you know, that 
come down, you know, in our family line. And so your father was a very unique person to be able to, you know, organize and keep this stuff along with your mom, I'm sure, because she kept the letters and she kept some of those things, but to keep a lot of that. So because a lot of the guys, when I was talking to some of them, it's like some of them want to keep the things and the others don't. The others just try to, it's memories it's, it, that's uh, not, not pleasant. And so they just want to, you know, they want to try to put that behind them. I mean, my father was kind of one of those. He just kind of wanted uh, to, um, to put all kind of that stuff behind. So, um, and now he being 87, he comes and talks about it more and more, um, you know, about some of his experiences, the joyful ones, um, and funny and things like that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, I think that we're living in the moment. We don't realize how valuable it is to share that information and keep that so that we can pass it down with those um, those that, that we love to be able to bring it forward. So I think it's a very unique book. I think it's uh, it's pretty cool, you know, to uh, to be able to, you know, some of the things I'm sure, but, you know, are difficult. But you, to, to look, I mean, being shot down, it's not a pleasant thing experience, but it's, um, you know, being able to share that experience with us is, is truly um uh, you know, not only fascinating, I hate to say, but it's, it's, um, it's just so it's just, it's just touching. It truly is touching. So thank you for that. Yep. Yeah, CC, I, I was, I was just going to say, Steve, I, I kind of, I kind of really appreciate your story and what you've done. Um, Cause I had uh, just a, just a very similar experience in that my father, when I was five was killed on active duty in an army training accident. So I didn't know him very well, but it was that particular instant in my life that later on when I grew up prompted me to join the military just out of curiosity because of my father. And when I first joined in 1981, all those years ago, I had no idea what I was going to do or how long I was going to stay in. So it was more uh, how can I say a, a tribute or a curiosity because of my father? And then there I was, you know, 21 years later, I finally retired. So, you know, I can understand your curiosity about wanting to find out, you know, what your father did. Um, it it kind of sparked my curiosity to join the military because of what happened to my father. So, you know, I, I can understand that and, and appreciate it. Yeah, CC, as you mentioned, you know, your dad didn't talk about uh, things. You know, most World War II veterans uh, didn't or, or don't talk about the war. Uh, they were an amazing group of men, and they just looked at, it, looked at it like, well, we had a job to do. We went over there. We did our job like everyone else, and then we came back home and got on with our lives. Like, you know, we're no heroes. You know, we just we did what we had to do, and uh, that's the way they – they are, and they, without a doubt, they're the greatest generation in my mind. Yeah, my dad was in the Korean War. He was in the Korean War, and um, and he he also flew, um, you know, flew a plane when they realized that he knew how to fly. And so some of the the things that they would give him, the I guess the jobs that they would give him to do, you know, he 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 thought there would be better. And so he's okay, I'll do it. You know? And then he finds out, Oh, wait a minute. They're shooting at me. <laughs> you know, flying over. This is like, I guess he had to fly over and take pictures. You know, he thought, Oh, that'd be easy enough. I just fly over. You know, I've, I've flown a plane at my, uh, my grandfather's, you know, Michigan cornfields, <laughs> you know, so he could do that. But then when he realized, wait, they're shooting at me down here. This isn't such a great, a great uh, experience. And so when, when you hear those kind of stories, you know, you're like, it's a different world. I mean, you just, you know, you see it in the movies, right? But when you hear it from your family members, or you read it in the letters that, you know, we're left behind and some of the stories that I'm sure some of the family members might have shared that their families had shared. It really becomes very, very real, very, you know, it's just um, it, it, just amazing, isn't it? I mean. Oh, yeah. What those guys did is, is, is incredible. Um, the men who flew combat missions in the 8th Air Force uh, were, were 
amazingly brave. There were 26,000 men that were killed uh, while serving in the 8th Air Force during World War II, which is more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific. And another 28,000 men became prisoners of war after their planes were knocked out of the sky by either German anti-aircraft fire or German uh, fighter planes. Uh, being a combat crewman in the 8th Air Force during World War II was the most dangerous duty assignment in the United States military. You know, they, those guys went back up day after day, not knowing if, you know, that mission would be, be their last, you know, fellow crewmen, you know, being killed, empty bunks when they came back, but they kept answering, answering the call. Yeah. Yeah. I, rem I remember my father saying the same thing. It's like you, they would fly out and you don't know how many's coming back, you know, maybe only one or two, you know, would come back. And it's, uh, yeah. yeah, he said, it's quite, um, it's quite an emotional experience, you know, for them to be able to to do that, to lose friends each each time, each mission, yeah, and just get up and do it again yeah. because they're they're asked to do, yeah. It's it's truly amazing. It truly is. Well, um, I hate to take a break, but we're going to have to do that. When we come back, let's um let's talk a little bit more about you know you writing the book because I think it's very inspirational. Um, not only the book itself, but also your journey of writing the book, because you did a lot of work in order to be able to bring such a wonderful book forward to us. And I think that can be very inspiring for those out there that are thinking, you know, maybe I have a story that I'd like to, you know, I'd like to share with the world, you know, and so we'd like to be able to embrace that and inspire those to be able to do that. And, um, and talk a little bit more about your publishing company. I don't know if you're still doing that, if you publish other books. So let's talk about that when we get back, okay? okay. So um, we're going to do a really quick break here, everyone. So I hope that you guys are enjoying WGSN-DB Going Solo Network. We are actually the number one singles network, and we're very proud of that. Our website is goingsolomedia.com. You will find many of our elite guests along with Steve Snyder right there on our website. All of his information is there. And also there's a little link to buy the book. So we hope that you'll do that. So we want to, uh, to embrace that. So if you guys will bear with us. We're going to have a quick break and we'll be right back. Okay, I want to thank you guys very much. I want to thank our, oh, what do we got going on here? Are we having this? There we go. <laughs> we got to get this hand down. We'll get it down eventually. We'll get it done. But also, before we start back with our show, I'd like to be able to share with you guys, we have a wonderful um you know, a wonderful sponsor on our show. And I'd like to be able to bring the information up. It's Quest Fine Jewelers. They're in Fairfax, Virginia. So we want to appreciate them for sponsoring our show. And they're going to be the sponsor for the Going Solo uh, Veterans Corner Show. So we're really excited about that. We're excited to be able to help our veterans and be able to get information out. So their number is 877-860-0826. And they're right there at 84. 31 Lee Highway in Fairfax, Virginia. So we want to thank them so much for sponsoring the show. Thank them for the lovely video to be able to share that with you. And we hope that you will stop in and say, hey, thank you for supporting um, WGSN 
to be going solo networking our veterans out there. So thank you again. Let's get on back to the show. We've got a lot of stuff happening here today with us. We have a wonderful um, author and uh, he has authored this wonderful book called Shot Down. It's a true story of the pilot, his father, which is Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17, Susan Ruth from, and he's all the way from Seal uh, Beach, California. And so we want to welcome back to our show. And, uh, and we really, truly appreciate Steve Snyder for being with us. Steve, now you were the past president of the uh, 306th uh, Bomb Group Historical Association. So welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Yeah, the 306 Bomb Group uh, was the bomb group that my dad was in uh, during the war. Uh, there were about, at its peak, 40 different bomb groups in the 8th Air Force that were stationed uh, in England during World War II. And so uh, my dad was in the 306 based at Thurlai, England, which is about 60 miles north of London. And I got involved in the association and I'm still on the board of directors and uh, past president. We have annual reunions of, uh, every year to, to honor and remember uh, those men who served. Oh, that's wonderful. I was going to ask you about that because I've never heard of that before, a bomb group, when, you know, and I, of course, I realized it had something to do with, you know, the service. But uh, so how many people would you say is in this uh, in this 306 bomb group historical association? So that's a group of people that want to. All right. So tell us, number one, how many people and what exactly do they do in this uh, group? Well, originally it was a veterans uh, association or a veterans group. It was formed by Russell Strong, who was a navigator in the 306 bomb group. After the war, he became uh, kind of the historian of the 306 bomb group and started the association and they had reunions. So the various veterans of the 306 would get together and you know rekindle friendships and exchange stories and so forth. But now, you know, as time uh, has gone on, you know, most of those veterans are no longer with us anymore. And so instead of a veterans organization it's become more of a historical uh, association, we still have a few veterans um, that come to our reunions, but uh, most of the, the group is made up of second generation or third generation, you know, sons and daughters or uh, grandkids or just people interested in the 306 bomb group. Uh, at our annual reunions, we probably have, oh, 120 of the members or so uh, uh, attend. Mm -hmm. We put out uh, a newsletter twice uh, twice a year called Echoes. It goes out to uh, probably about 300 people about various articles and uh, things that have happened uh, and historical articles and things like that. And a number of the bomb groups uh, similar to the 306 that were in the 8th Air Force uh, do this as well. And basically, it's uh, our mission is to uh, remember the air war over Europe, to honor the men who fought it, and to educate the public about it, especially the younger generations. And that's really why I do what I do as, you know, it's 75 years since World War, or the war in Europe ended, and it's fading in people's memory. And uh, we can't let that happen. We have to keep the, the memory alive and educate the public about what those men did to preserve all the freedoms that we enjoy today. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Now, y'all, we have Paul Holbert here with us. He is the host of uh, Going Solo Veterans Corner, which is a new show that's starting. So thank you again, Paul, for um, coming on the show here with us today. So tell, uh, Paul, do you have any questions or anything like that that you want to share um, with um, with Steve here today? Well, I, um, I wanted to, to share one thing, especially what Steve said, how important it is not to forget you know, what, what all these people did. And it's an interesting note because uh, I work, uh, while I live in Northern Virginia, I work in downtown DC. And on occasion, I have an opportunity to see one of those World War II vets and albeit most of the time they're in wheelchairs and they're with their family. And um, so whenever I do see one, I always make it, uh, I, I make it, my my particular goal to go over and speak to them 
um, because it is important, like Steve said, to make sure that they're not forgotten, you know, the things that they did and the sacrifices they made because the younger generations really are not aware. Um, you know, so many people today are not, the younger folks are not interested in history like maybe some of us were. Um, and definitely you can tell the way Steve is excited about what he's doing. Um, so, I, I, you know, that's definitely an important point that, you know, we, we've got to make sure that we don't forget. But Steve, I did want to ask you, um, just, just going back for a moment to when your um, father's plane was shot down, um, how, many, how many missions had they been on? Were they anywhere close to that 25 mission yardstick that they usually used? Or, you know, were they still a ways from that before they were able to get to that mark? Oh, very good question, Paul. Um, kind of a little history, though. The, uh, the first mission that the 8th Air Force flew was on August 17th of 1942. And initially, they, there weren't any mission limits. Um, but in 1943, the morale of these combat crews was really going into the tank because they realized that they were never going to make it home. Uh, they were either going to be killed or they'd be shot down and become prisoners of war. And in the spring of 1943, the flight surgeon of the 306 bomb group, Dr. Thurman Schuler, uh, realized this and he sent a letter to uh, Ira Aker, who was the commander of the 8th Air Force, saying that we need to implement a mission limit. Uh, he suggested 20, uh, but Aker set it at 25. But at least these combat crews had, you know, some goal that they could try to reach and a light at the end of the tunnel that if they reached those 25 missions, they could go back home. Uh, it's interesting to note, though, that in 1943, uh, when the 8th Air Force was taking devastating losses, that it was statistically impossible to complete 25 missions. The average number of missions flown in 1943 before being shot down was only six. Um, my dad and his, uh, going back to your to answer to your question, uh, my dad was shot down on his eighth mission. Um, of his 10 man crew, some of his crew had more missions than he did, and some had less. Uh, my dad was, uh, was the center on the uh, basketball team, and he tore the ligaments in his ankle, and he couldn't fly for a couple months. So some of his crew had uh, more missions, but then other crew members had fewer because some of them had been injured on combat missions and some of them were, were sick. Uh, with that damp, cold weather uh, in England, guys were getting sick and getting the flu and getting pneumonia all the time. So they were you know, hospitalized. Uh, and uh, so they didn't, they missed a lot of missions. Now, a lot of people think that uh, a crew, they flew all their missions together, but that was rarely the case because uh, my, either they, were, they had injured crew members or uh, ill crew members. Actually, my dad only flew two missions with his full crew. Uh, the last mission on February 8th that they were shot down and then the mission uh, before that. Uh, uh, the mission limit was gradually raised uh, even higher than 25 later in the war when uh, Jimmy Doolittle took over as commander of the 8th Air Force. In January of 1944, he eventually raised it to 30 and then to 35 Ooh. because the missions, uh, well, I shouldn't say they were still plenty dangerous. But in 1944, the Luftwaffe was basically pretty much uh, wiped out uh, by the 8th Air Force, particularly the P-51 Mustangs. Um, so those after, say, D-Day, uh, June 6th of 44, the combat crew still had to deal with that heavy anti-aircraft fire, uh, but they no longer had to really worry about the German fighters. So anyway, my dad, <laughs> that's a long story, a uh, winded uh, way to answer your question, but my dad, it was his eighth mission. Oh, that's very mm -hmm. fascinating. I had no idea that they even had, they even had that. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so, yeah. The Germans had no mission limits. They just flew until they died. So most of the uh, experienced Luftwaffe pilots uh, were killed. Hans Berger, um, 
all, all, almost all of his friends were killed in the war and Hans was shot down three times, but uh, he luckily made it, made it through the war. It's just it's just amazing. It's a wonderful book, and I want to thank you so much for sharing that with us today. So I wanted to ask you that, that with regards to inspiring other people to um, you know write their journey, write their story, write their family's journey. Um, so to to embark on that, is there any words that you would like to share with those out there that are thinking about doing something like that? Oh, uh, sure. Um, well, to begin with, I had no uh, writing background or training uh, whatsoever. Uh, I always kind of liked to write. I, I was in sales and sales management, and I liked to write marketing materials and in different things uh, during during my career. So uh, that just points out that you know I had no professional background in in writing, and the books become. Uh, uh, it has a five-star reader review rating on Amazon, and it's won almost 30 book awards uh, mm -hmm. in the time that it, it's been published. And if you, if you have a story to share, you should uh, write it down. And there's uh, lots of ways to publish independently or, uh, these days. Mm -hmm. uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, the route I took was a more complicated and expensive route. Yeah. Um, but there's lots of uh, avenues where you can just load your manuscript at different uh, uh, internet sites and then they'll do all, they'll publish your book for you. It's called print on demand. So you don't have to, you know, print a bunch of books to, uh, and incur the expense uh, for that. Um, you can just print as, no, as many as uh, are, are necessary. So there's, there's lots of tools out there for people who uh, have a story, whether it's a uh, nonfiction or, or, or fiction, uh, where you can publish uh, a book. I mean, I was really passionate uh, about mm -hmm. this, and I thought it was such an amazing story that I felt pretty confident that uh, it would be interesting to readers. Uh, if unless you're a celebrity or you know a really well-known person, uh, exposure is your big problem as an independent and author. If you're mm -hmm. if you're famous, you know all you have to do is publish a book, and then all the media, the radio, the TV, the newspapers spread it all over the world, and right. you sell millions of copies. But if you're an unknown person, like uh, most of us are, <laughs> uh, you know the the big challenge is trying to get exposure. If you want to try to sell, uh, get your book out there so people know about it, because no matter how good a book is, unless people know about it, they're not going to. Uh, yeah. They're not, it's yeah. not read. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now I have your website up here and your email again. Now, can we find the book on your website? Um, do you sell it through your website too? Yeah, actually, if someone wants an autograph, a personally signed book, they can go to my, my website and on the homepage there, uh, there's a little buy now button where you can pay by credit card and then I'll sign it to, uh, uh, personally sign it to, uh, uh, however the person wants me to. And then, uh, they can pay by credit card and then I, I, I mail it to them. So a lot of books are sold that way. Most people buy the book on Amazon because mm -hmm. well, over 50% of all books sold are sold uh, on Amazon. Yeah. And yeah. but you know what? It makes a nice gift. Yours, your book would be a very nice gift and have it auto, you know, have you, um, you know, with your uh, autograph on it would be awesome. It would be a very nice gift for someone. So in, anyone thinking about, you know, if, holidays or whatever if you pay, do things in advance this would be an awesome book to give someone so uh so definitely do that too it's steve s-c-e-v-e -E, snyder s-y s-n-y-d-e-r author a-u-t-h-o-r-n dot com so that's his website so you can you can go on there and just you know buy it get him to you know do the signature and, and send it to someone you love that would be a, a great gift wonderful gift and yeah. also, uh, it's available as a print book, both hardcover and so, uh, paperback, also in all ebook formats, Kindle or Nook or mm -hmm. what have you, and also even as an audio book, but there's no pictures in the audio book. Yeah. See, I think having the pictures would be awesome. It'd be yeah. great, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if they do it anymore now, but the coffee table books, you know, we like the coffee table books, remember? So uh, it would be a nice book to put on your coffee table. So, yeah, that so would be great. Hey, Steve. 
Yeah. I, I was just going to say you had you had spoken a lot about your father and his experiences. And, you know, one thing that I'm sure you you don't forget about, but a lot of people do is um, how how did the rest of your family deal with his experiences and his situation? For instance, like your mom, you know, I'm sure it was a struggle for her. You know, I'm sure it was a stressful time for her. And so, so how did, how did your family come through all that? Uh, another good question, Paul. Yeah. Um, it was really hard on my mother because not only did she have Susan, Susan Ruth, a uh, one year old, uh, little baby girl, but my other sister, Nancy, was born while my dad was missing in action. Mm. Uh, and as I mentioned, my dad was missing in action for, for seven months. So here she was back in Pasadena, California, um, with a one-year-old girl, an infant baby, and not knowing if she'd ever see her, her husband again. Uh, after the plane was shot down, she got a telegram from the War Department saying that her husband was missing in action. And uh, that's all she knew until my dad got back to England and then sent her a telegram in uh, later September of 44, where he said uh, he was fit as a fiddle uh, and <laughs> to, uh, bank the money, honey, because he all, had all that back pay from uh, uh, those seven months while he was uh, missing in action. Uh, so that uh, obviously that was a uh, glorious day uh, for my mother and all, you know, uh, my dad's parents and uh, the relatives back home. I didn't come along until a couple of years after the war. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that, was a, that was a heck of a way to earn a bankroll, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. That, that was really hard on the families of the crew. And as I uh, alluded to earlier, uh, some of the excerpts of the letters that the, the family members exchanged after the plane went down, whether they're mothers or wives or sweethearts, you know, writing to each other, you know, tr for moral support and, and praying for their safety uh, and return, not knowing what happened to them are very moving letters that, uh, that are in the book. And, you know, some of those people had happy results when half of the crew came back home and other of the families, you know, had tragic results when five of those crew members did not return. Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's amazing. It's amazing that the journey and the story, the story and all of it is truly amazing. And one that, um, you know, just thinking about it again, it's one that needs to be needs to be heard. It needs to be um, shared with everyone. And it needs to not be forgotten, you know, so it's not only the what all they went through, but the reason why they went through it. And so it's it's a uh, it's just very touching. So thank you so much. We truly appreciate you being on the show here today. Oh, it's, it, it's my pleasure just to give a little teaser uh, yeah. to people out there. Mm -hmm. uh, after my dad bailed out, uh, as I said, he was missing in action for seven months. For the majority of the time, he was hidden by various Belgian people that hid him from the uh, the Germans. And uh, he almost got discovered several times that are described in the book. And then finally, he got tired of hiding. And so he joined the French resistance called the Mackie. And he started f mm -hmm. fighting against the Germans, sabotaging German uh, convoys. And the number of encounters that the French resistance group he was with had with the Germans are in the book. Uh, and then finally, after you know, one day word came that there were U.S. troops in a nearby village of Trelon, France. And he walked into the village and uh, identified himself. And then that's how he got back to England. So not only was he had the uh, danger of being hidden uh, for months with the Germans looking for him, but he even decided to get back into the fight and fight mm -hmm. with the French resistance was was an amazing, brave and courageous thing to do. Yeah, your father yeah. is definitely a very unique individual indeed. So uh, just a, an amazing, amazing person. And uh, what an awesome repre representation of, of uh, the United States. I mean, you know, think about him being able to not only, you know, service here, you know, he's protecting us in, in all ways possible. So that's, that's just amazing. It truly is, it truly is. So yeah, it's great.
Well, we're going to have to close the show. I hate to do that because it's so interesting. And I think we could keep you on here and just get, go from each chapter to chapter would be awesome <laughs> and go through each book. But we want to buy the book. So uh, I hope that you guys will support the veterans here um, on our station. And um, of course, Steve Snyder is the author of a wonderful book. Again, it's called Shot Down. So we'll show uh, his information here. It's called Shot Down. It's a true story of a pilot, Howard Snyder, which is his father, and the crew of the B-17, uh, Susan Ruth. And uh, we want to thank you so much for sharing uh, the the journey a little bit here with us and giving us the teasers so that we'll uh, purchase the book and uh, learn a lot more because I think there's a lot more um, information there, not only of your father, but also of uh, those uh, in the crew. So. I think it's very, very fascinating. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, CC. I appreciate it very much. Nice meeting you, Paul. Um, mm -hmm. Good luck with your uh, new venture. Oh, thank uh, you. Everyone, everyone, Looking forward to it. Everyone stay safe. Yes, you too. You too, definitely. And we'll hopefully have you back on again, maybe talk, chat a little bit more. It would be nice uh, to be able to... Uh, to bring you forward. So thank you so much for being one of our elite guests. We do appreciate it. And again, all of our information about Steve Snyder is right there on our website, goingsolomedia.com. And uh, we want to thank you all for listening. So again, this is WGSNDB Going Solo Network. And uh, we are listening to the Author's Corner, Meet the Author, with our wonderful author here today, uh, Steve Snyder, with his terrific book, Shot Down. So I hope you guys will purchase that. And uh, if you want to get an autograph, uh, copy. Just go to our website um, and all of his information is right there and he'll sign it for you and you it's something that great gift. It would be a wonderful gift to give someone and maybe one for yourself would be great. So we want you guys to do that. And um, I want to thank again, uh, Paul um, Holbert for being on the show here with us. He's going to be our host for the new show, which is called Going Solo Veterans Corner. And um, we'll try to twist Steve's arm to get him to come back on and talk mm -hmm. to Paul a little bit bit further about it. And uh, I think that that would be great. Again, we want to thank our wonderful um, sponsors today, Quest Fine Jewelers. They're um, really terrific people. They're supporting us, you know, just along the way. And we want to thank them so much for that. It's Quest Fine Jewelers. You can reach them at 877-860-0826. Their address is 8431 Lee Highway, Fairfax, Virginia. We want to thank them so much. We've got, uh, if you want to know some more information, we've got a wonderful video right on our YouTube channel uh, that we shared here um, during our break. But um, just go and do a shout out and uh, say hi to them when it's safe after the coronavirus. So we hope that you guys do that. Okay, we got to go. We love you. We hope we'll catch you right here back, uh, back here at the same time, same place next week. Bye for now. <laughs>